Hello noble ones! On this video we're going to try and bring forth a researched, unbiased and coherent proposition for what Jesus of Nazareth might have looked like, his physical appearance. This isn't a new subject of study by any means, as already from the second century onward various theories about the appearance of Jesus were advanced. I've already made a video on whether or not historical Jesus or Yeshua existed addressing the question through ancient Roman and mostly non-Christian sources, so for that question I will refer you to my previous video. For this video we will try to determine four possible characteristics of historical Jesus. The most probable ethnicity, including skin, hair and eye colour, whether or not he had long hair and facial hair, his overall build and what kind of clothing he would have likely worn. We'll try and understand where this white, blue-eyed, European-looking Jesus came from in all of his versions, however, I'll also address the vision of the Son of Man from the Book of Revelations, because I know that there will be a lot of people inappropriately spamming my comment section with that scripture. That's because that scripture has been used over and over again to prove that Jesus was a black African, and if you disagree with that scripture, even politely, then apparently you're a racist. I will translate that passage from the original language word by word and I will tell you what it actually says and then you make your mind. I'll approach this the following way. We will start from a complete clean slate, ready to build up a plausible image without any expectations or personal preferences. I see too many people approach this endeavour in a very flawed, unscientific, non-academic way. They have an image in their mind which they really want to be true and they try and find as much proof as possible to solidify that image, ignoring completely anything that points towards a different direction. In other words, that's searching for, interpret, favour and recall information in a way that confirms or supports one's prior beliefs or values. That's what we call confirmation bias, the tendency to interpret new evidence as confirmation on one's existing beliefs or theories. For any research to make sense we need to always be ready to engage with information that challenges our views and accept what the data tells us, whether we like it or not. I'm only interested in what the evidence points out. It can be brown, white, black or green Jesus, it would make zero difference to me and I'll happily accept whatever the evidence suggests. However, I'm not going to support a specific colour of Jesus just to bolster a political or religious agenda or follow a social media trend. Let's look at the data, let's see the historical context, let's be intellectually honest. Let's begin with an interesting fact. The Gospels give us no physical description of Jesus like at all and yet nobody ever notices that. Now really think about it. The reason why you don't notice unless someone points it out to you, even if you read them, is because we all assume that we know what Jesus looked like. Hence, we don't notice the lack of description. This is because of the enormous amount of imagery, movies and art in general that represent him and that is constantly around us. This image is stamped in our subconscious at an early age. Whether you're a Christian, an atheist, it doesn't matter in this case. The image has most likely been imprinted in your mind too. That is the power of subconscious conditioning. So strong that our mind fills in the gap present in the Gospels. But are these images accurate? Where do they come from? What's the historical background? The origins of this European-looking Jesus are to be found first in the early representations of Imperial Rome, then in the Byzantine Empire, all the way throughout the medieval period, the Renaissance, and then of course this trend continued in modern art. Emperor Constantine at the beginning of the 3rd century made Christianity the state of religion. That had massive repercussions to everything that concerned Christianity, including sacred iconography, but I'll get to that when discussing the supposed letters of Pontius. Pilatus to Emperor Tiberius on another video. Nonetheless, we do need to be careful, because when looking at period iconography, if we don't understand the historical context and the cultural context of the specific people that created that iconography, we might be misled and we might not fully understand what's being represented. To give you an example of what I mean when I say that things need to be understood within their own culture and possibly language is the fact that the lack of description of Jesus isn't the only missing piece of information concerning him. The name Jesus itself, when you read the Bible in English for example, without knowing the historical and cultural background of first century Judea, you will get the wrong impression that Jesus was some sort of unique name. 
as only he was called Jesus. That is because of an arbitrary, deliberate mistranslation from the original language. In reality, his name was one of the most common names in first century Judea. Flavius Josephus, a first century Romano-Jewish historian who was born in Jerusalem in 37 AD, names at least 12 people named Jesus or Yehoshua in Hebrew, which can be translated as God saves or God delivers. Children were named Yehoshua or Yeshua for shorter at this time because that expressed a desire that people had for salvation, although at this time we're not talking about spiritual salvation just yet. We're talking about actual deliverance from tribulation, which included domination of a foreign power. Yehoshua was often shortened in everyday colloquial speech to Yeshua, and in the Galilee pronunciation it became even shorter, which is where the Greek Jesus comes from, with the S added to make it a nominative case. From that you have the Latin Jesus, but even in the Bible itself, he's not the only person named Yeshua. Joshua, successor of Moses, if you read it in the original language, has the same name, same spelling. Yeshua. Same for Joshua the son of Nun. The name is used 28 times for Joshua the high priest and there are many other instances. In English and in other modern languages when they created a the translation they decided instead to separate these names and just call him Jesus, so Jesus and then the other ones they will call them Joshua. That is a fabrication. It's the exact same name. This is to show you how much knowing the cultural and historical context sheds light on the information presented. One thing we can say for sure is that there have been plenty of very different images of Jesus over the centuries. The way he looks changes a lot, particularly in the early period, when the now Christianized Roman authorities were trying to find the best way to present him to the population. Keep this thought in mind because it's one of the keys to understand what we are about to see. Look at this 4th century image of Jesus. Here he looks just like a Roman. He's white, short-haired, clean-shaven, as he's resurrecting Lazarus. Should we consider this image an accurate representation of Jesus of Nazareth? Or is it just the local power, the Romans, trying to push to the people an image they know people will accept and like? I'd say definitely the latter. Why? If you remember from my previous video, I have brought forth several sources that showed that people in Rome knew about the Christians and distinguished them from the Jews. The general idea about the Christians in the Roman world was very negative. They were considered superstitious, strange people who worshipped a crucified God. That's why once the Romans become Christians, they start trying to change his looks so that it would appear more Roman. Here's another early image showing once again, a beardless young-looking Jesus, this time with black slightly longer but still short hair, representing the gospel instance of a woman with a problem of an issue of blood being cured by touching his tunic. Young-looking clean-shaven Jesus keeps appearing throughout the 4th century, as in this sarcophagus of Junius Bassus, Roman senator, where he now starts getting medium-length hair. Images and iconography over time give us clues on how people think, the governing and the governed. Look at these two images. What is going on? What's happening is a deification of the historical Jesus. Jesus starts looking less and less human and more like a god. But what kind of god? A god from the perspective of the Greco-Roman world, to whom he was now preached. What did ancient Greek and Roman gods usually look like? Well, this is Dionysus, and I'm sure you can immediately spot a similarity here. This is what the people were used to when imagining a god. There are, of course, other looks for gods, but remember, Dionysus is a god of wine-making, and Jesus turned water into wine, so we can see why they went for this look for the people. At first. As we continue our research, we finally reach the very famous and often mentioned Jesus in Santa Pudenziana in Rome from 415 Anno Domini. Here we see that the image of Jesus towards the end of the 4th century and the beginning of the 5th century in this particular instance is now moving from a young, beautiful Dionysus or Apollos looking god into a wise and powerful god, a ruler. Look at this image at the catacomb of Commodilla mid-4th century, one of the earliest images of bearded Jesus. Christian doctrine is based on the teaching that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, from the point of view of the early Christians in Judea, that God would be Elohim. But from the point of view of the Greeks, who was the father of the gods? Who was the king of the gods? 
Zeus. In the Greco-Roman world, images of Zeus were very popular and very easily recognizable. It shouldn't surprise us, therefore, that Jesus, when represented as a ruler and a heavenly king, gains a striking resemblance with Zeus, son of God, in perspective. The long hair, the beard and the long robes are all features of the Olympian Zeus and of the so-called 2nd century Zeus Serapis, which is usually originated as an iconography in Egypt, as explained by Professor Joan Taylor. What's interesting is that Egyptian iconography of Zeus is also relevant because remember that at the time Egypt was part of the Roman province of Africa Proconsularis. So Jesus is being represented as the Son of God in a way that can be fully understood by the populations of the ancient Mediterranean. Roman and Greek people had no idea how the populations of Judea perceived Elohim. Considering also the biblical verse in Exodus which says you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above. These images are not representing historical Jesus, also because he's wearing the sort of clothing worn by the wealthy, worn by the rich, which he himself in Christian scripture speaks against, such as in the Gospel of Mark. And in his teaching he said, beware of the scribes who desire to walk in long robes and to have salutations in the marketplaces. What we can take from this is that this specific contradiction tells us that this is not to be taken as an historical representation of historical Jesus. It's an image created with a specific purpose made for a specific people. Let's now briefly address the argument that I've had to hear multiple times that you usually find in comment sections of videos such as this one that has to do with Revelations 1, 14 and 15, the vision of the Son of Man, and that supposedly this scripture should be proof that Jesus was in fact a black African and every single time that I have politely disagreed with such a statement, I've been told that I'm an effing racist and that I hate black people. Spoiler alert. I don't hate black people. Now I know that there are a lot of viewers on my channel that are actually black people and understand perfectly where I'm coming from and they know that I'm not racist, but let's entertain the other side. Let's have a look at the scripture and then you'll see what I mean. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burnt in a furnace and his voice as the sound of many waters. Okay, so how is this verse used to push the idea that Jesus was a black African man? Well, they say that a skin like burnt bronze means that he had a black skin, and they also say that hair white as wool is actually talking about the consistency, so to the touch, and woolly feeling hair means African equals, if you don't say he was African, you're a racist. I love the logic. There is, however, a big problem with that. They use English and they fixate on the meaning of single words. Let's have a look at what it said in Greek, the original language in which those two verses were written. The and kefale the head auf du of him ke and he the triches has ke white horse as if erion wool leufkon white horse as hion snow. Okay, and then it continues talking about the eyes being flames of fire, which I don't really think people believe that that represents historical Jesus anyway, since this is a vision that is seen of resurrected Jesus, and we'll get to that in a minute. But as you can see, the original language, I love how they cherry pick. It says, and. This term means and in English, sometimes also. Conjunction. It connects two different nouns. The head and the hair separately so already when we read it accurately we see that both the head and the hair are white is there any possible way that this word actually meant hair no in all greek literature that word only means the head do i therefore believe now that jesus was a white man no because i'm being intellectually honest but if you're going to use this verse, then use it for what's written. Separate things, the head and the hair, they were white, meaning glowing because it's a resurrected being. Also, is there any possible way, and I've asked two experts of the Greek language, is there any possible way that in the way it's written, it could refer to the texture of the hair? The answer was 
No, this is kala in both cases. It's saying it's white as wool, kala, white as snow. It's a reinforcer. You have to imagine it in a context such as his hair was white as wool and the other person saying, really? And then he's saying, yes, white as snow. Both times it's talking about the color. There is absolutely no doubt about it. The other verse. Okay. And who the for this feet of two of him whom you like Khalkolivano fine bronze. Just for added context, this is fine bronze. This is the color. Os as en in camino a furnace Pepiro Menes having been refined. Now more context. Bronze in a furnace is melted. It's molten bronze. This is bronze in a furnace. Translating this word that now we've just translated as refined as burnt, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's just one of the many possible translations. But the more literal, the most literal translation would be that fire has been applied. So it's been fired. Fire has been applied. And you can find this in any dictionary. Burn is one possibility fire being applying, but also it has been made to glow. Moral of the story, this is what molten bronze inside a furnace looks like. Point to me one population on this planet that has a skin that looks like this. Now, I know that the more secular of you would be telling me, yeah, but this is, ju this is just a revelation. It's like a spiritual thing. Why are you even bringing it up? I understand, but I'm bringing it up because people bring it up and I need to respond to this because even in the context of Christian belief, if you don't cherry pick and you are honest about the scriptures, you read or you bring forth, it doesn't make sense because Again, this is a representation of the resurrected Christ, and that's a problem because a lot of these people don't even read the scriptures. We can see that there is specifically a difference between Christ before his death and Christ after his resurrection. A physical difference. John 20, 14. Mary Magdalene sees the resurrected Jesus. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. She doesn't recognize him, so he looked differently. Not the only case. John 21, 4. But when morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. So we're talking about the closest ones to him. Verse 7. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said unto Peter, It is the Lord. Peter had to be told, Mate, that's Jesus. Hence, if you're a Christian and you are serious about the Gospels, then you can't ignore the fact that through Gospel scripture we see that Jesus looked differently after his resurrection. Using the passage on Revelation which specifically talks about resurrected Jesus tells us absolutely nothing about his ethnicity as a man walking Galilee before his death and resurrection. Doesn't even stop there, I can continue. Verse 5, Then Jesus said unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, no, they don't recognize the voice either. And big thanks to Luke for providing the recording of the pronunciation in Greek. Thank you, Luke. I hope that that clarifies the context of that specific scripture. Let's move on. Now that we have identified what he probably didn't look like, let's try and understand what he most likely looked like. To do this, we need to see what a man from Judea looked like specifically in the first century. Now, I've got iconography, coins, so I got you covered, but before doing that, a possible counter-argument that I could receive could be, well, it doesn't really make any sense to see what people at the time from Galilee looked like, because how do we know that he actually did look like them? How do we know that he didn't look completely different from the rest of the population? We can't know for sure, however, we do have an interesting hint. In this part, we're going to talk about a hidden hint that we find in the Gospels when we read the description of the arrest of Jesus in Gethsemane. The thing is, though, that I know that some people will argue and will tell me in the comments, why do you even use the Gospels? You shouldn't use them because they are religious books. Thing is, though, that right now I am trying to use everything we have. I'm using everything. Now, of course, I'm not saying that they are a 100% reliable source from a scientific and academic point of view. However, even though they are religious books, they are still books written in the first century. So they're still period books that can help us understand what people thought at the time. 
All four Gospels accounts tell us that when Jesus was arrested, Judas, who betrayed him famously, was leading a large crowd which included some Roman officers, Roman soldiers. Now, when Judas leads the Roman authorities and then takes them to Jesus, he needs to point out who Jesus was among the disciples with the famous Judas kiss. So he needs to go to him, kiss him, so that the Roman soldiers would know who they were supposed to arrest. Hence, he looked just like all the other disciples. If he had been extremely tall, Judas could have just said, arrest the tall one. If he had been extremely short, or how some people say, completely crooked, then again, he could have just said that. He's just a crooked one, very short, just get him. If he looked different from an ethnic point of view, so if he looked white, blonde, with blue eyes, he could have said, oh yeah, yeah, that guy, you know, the foreign looking guy. And that's the same if he looked like a black African, they could have said, you know, the black guy. But he didn't. He gave him a kiss as the only way to point out this is Jesus of Nazareth. Now, that's interesting. Again, we can't say that this is definitive proof because, as I say, there is no way for us to verify that this account is actually real from an academic point of view. Clearly, if you're a Christian, you believe it to be real, but that's your own personal faith and your own own personal choice. In the academic approach, you need evidence. Still, it's interesting that a book written in the first century tells us something like that, like that. It doesn't tell us that that's exactly how things happened, but it does tell us that from the perspective of people from that area who wrote these things about Jesus, he looked exactly like everyone else. This could also explain why he wasn't described physically in the Gospels. It could be because there was really no reason to do so. If you tell me Michael is from Congo, I will imagine him black because if Mike from Congo was white and had blonde hair, you would most likely tell me that because it would be not the norm in that geographical area. And today we have got airplanes and we can travel a lot more and a lot more easily than they did back in the day. Same thing about Mike from Sweden. If Mike from Sweden is black and has long black locks, I would point it out to you. If instead it looked like most people in that area, I might omit that piece of information because I could consider it obvious. Okay, so what did people from first century Judea look like and how can we know? Well, these coins were minted in the Roman world after the Jewish rebellion of 70 AD and subsequent defeat at the hands of the Roman legions. In these coins, we see a Jewish captive and a Jewish priest possibly bending the knee to the Roman army. Note that in both cases, they are represented bearded. That is, of course, the Roman perception of the Jewish nation because they perceived them as a nation of philosophers. This is a representation of Moses found on the walls of the 3rd century synagogue of Dura Europos, which shows how a Jewish sage was represented in the Greco-Roman world. Note again the presence of a beard, the hair, relatively short, and note the darker skin tone. This, of course, doesn't mean that Jesus would have definitely looked like him but we are getting closer to a more probable appearance. Professor Jones again brings forth the forensic studies credited to scientists such as Israeli biohistorian Yossi Nagar, whom is not only studying skeletal remains, but is also trying to determine all aspects of the human body, trying to understand people's average height, ethnic profiles in Judea and other skeletons of neighboring people in the same time period. The Israel Antiquities Authorities has a department of osteology based in Jerusalem which is in charge of studying skeletal remains. All the basic demographic, metric and descriptive data of the archaeological skeletons found in Israel were then inserted in the Human Osteological Database which was created in 1994. Thanks to these studies it is possible to recreate a comprehensive anthropological profile of the populations living in 1st century Judea. This is because it's not only a method of analysis based on the skeletal remains within a very wide time frame, but also because it's a comparative one, comparing bioarchaeological data from various periods and geographical regions. According to Yossi Nagar, the data seems to point to the idea that people of the period, so we're talking about the times of the second temple, so first century in this case, although that's a bit of a wider image, but people of that specific time period would have a lot in common with modern Iraqi Jews. And Professor Jones agrees with this data and states that 
Iraqi Jews are the closest in skeletal type to what is found in first century burials. Now having said this, a question would be, is it really possible to determine accurately an individual's ethnicity through the examination of his skeletal remains? Well, several scholars have discussed the importance of, for example, the skull morphometry as a discriminative factor between populations and, more precisely, measurements of the face are better from this purpose than, for example, measurements of the vault. So, we are talking about data regarding craniofacial measurements. Now, clearly, age estimation, sex determination are easier from this point of view. We are not talking a 100% perfectly accurate science, However, the more samples scientists can work with, the more precise these measurements can be. We are basically talking about cranial morphological features that are common with individuals pertaining to a specific ethnic group or inhabiting a specific area. And generally speaking, regression equations derived from measurements of the cranial base indicate a 70 to 90 percent accuracy for classifying blacks and whites. Now, I understand that there are some people in our day and age that are sort of using these images of these skulls to say, look, underneath we are all humans and therefore skin shouldn't matter. And I am a big supporter of the idea of we are all equal and we shouldn't be racist towards other people, but let's not cancel out scientific data. There is a difference in cranial shape between individuals of different ethnicities. And just underlying this doesn't mean that I am racist. Now, I'm also aware that unfortunately in the recent past some pseudoscientists tried to use this data to push forward racist ideologies such as the idea of there is a difference in the shape of the skull between whites and blacks and therefore whites are more intelligent. This has been debunked. No one believes this anymore who is a credited scientist and we shouldn't completely ditch osteology as a sector of studies just because some people used some of these techniques to prove or push forward irrational racist agendas. Therefore, in light of these studies, it is highly probable, still not 100% certain, but highly probable that the average Judean of the time would have likely had dark brown or black hair olive to brown skin and brown eyes. Also, it is important to say that Judean men of the time period were on average about 165 tall, which would be 5 feet 5 inches in height. Okay, with the data we have gathered up to this point, we have kind of understood the most probable color of hair, color of eyes and skin and possible body type of Jesus of Nazareth or Yeshua. Now, diving a bit more in details into the skin coloration pattern, it's interesting to see that there are actually two scales that can help us classify or that usually exist to help classify skin typology in humans. The Fitzpatrick phototyping scale, created in 1975 by American dermatologist Thomas B. Fitzpatrick, and the von Luchans chromatic scale. However, the latter has now been abandoned because of its inconsistency in providing reliable data. I will still give you a reference to what I think, in both scales, the most probable skin hue for Yeshua, according to the data we have gathered, would be, but keep in mind, the first scale, the Fitzpatrick scale, would be more reliable. Just to give you a bit more background on this chromatic scale, it was created to estimate the response of different types of skin to ultraviolet light, or UV. So it can be used to try and understand, for example, the percentages of a patient's risk to skin cancer, just to mention one. In other words, there is nothing racist about this scale. Just putting it out there. The Fitzpatrick scale is divided into six types, type 1 being the palest and type 6 being the darkest. According to this scale, Yeshua's skin would have most likely been classified as a type 4 olive to moderate brown, which rarely has any problems with sunburning and tans very easily. And if we had to counterpart this to the von Luchens chromatic scale, it would mean that it would have a chromatic range between 21 and number 27. Of course, we don't know which of these it would precisely be. We can't pinpoint it, so I leave that up to you. Which one do you think it would be? To me, we do have to remember that because of what he was doing, he was working, he was doing physical work, it was working, was the son of a woodcutter, he was preaching outside, it is possible that he would have been exposed to the sun more than perhaps other people. Which to me gives me a more of a tendency of thinking towards the darker side of this spectrum. 
Now please keep in mind that all of this is our best guess of what the heck was going on in that specific place and in that specific time. We however have just scratched the surface because to make the situation even more complicated we have to remember one historical fact. The compulsory displacement of the House of Israel, which complicates things even further. Numerous migrations have been attested throughout the centuries that which have to do with the populations of Galilee. The Babylonian captivity of the 6th century BC and a serious dislocation from the homeland. We also know the Jews dwelled in Egypt in the 6th century BC, as papyri from a Jewish military colony at Elephantine reveal. The conquests of Alexander the Great sent Greeks into the Near East in substantial numbers, not to forget the collapse of the Persian Empire, which prompted a wave of migration and relocation once again. And then of course we have the Roman intervention in the Near East, which accelerated again migration and made things more complicated, bringing an unspecified number of Jews to Italy as human booty. This is just to tell you that even if we tried to look at Mary, Jesus' mother, the sort of ethnicity she has, again, it's our best guess, but even having examined the representations of the period and the osteological results, we still cannot know for sure if Mary's ancestors, for example, had been relocated somewhere and some intermixing of some kind had happened. Being 100% honest about it, the data we have at the moment doesn't allow us to pinpoint a specific ethnicity 100%. To talk about the length of hair of Yeshua, so the most probable look in terms of how long his hair was, there are two words that we need to examine in details, the word Nazarene and the word Nazarite. Jesus was a Nazarene, which means that he was from Nazareth. Now, of course, he wasn't born in Nazareth, he was born in Bethlehem, but he spent his life in Nazareth, so he was technically from there. But was he a Nazarite? And most importantly, what is a Nazarite? In the Hebrew Bible and in the Hebrew culture, a Nazarite is one who voluntarily took a vow, which is described in Numbers 6, 1 to 21. This was a way to sort of come into an allegiance with God and to prove your devotion to God. Among other things, the vow included not cutting your hair, so letting the locks of your hair grow long, avoiding drinking wine specifically, and avoiding touching or getting too close to dead bodies, although that specifically means dead human bodies. There are two examples of Nazarites in the Hebrew Bible, namely Samson, very famous in Judges 13, and Samuel in 1 Samuel. There were two types of Nazarite. Nazarites who entered their vow at their birth, meaning that it was their mother who actually consecrated them to Elohim. And so they would have that vow of never cutting the length of their hair, not drinking wine and not touching dead bodies for the rest of their lives. And this was the case with both Samson and Samuel and possibly even John the Baptist. But it was also possible for an adult to decide to enter into this specific vow for a set amount of time, at the end of which he would have shaved his head entirely, taken his hair and offered it as an offering to God. Jesus was also a Nazarite, then yes, his hair would have been very long and that would have been a recognizable feature of Jesus. The idea of letting the length of your hair grow was a way for people to immediately recognize, oh, that man or that woman is taking a vow. It was a physical manifestation of a personal inner vow that you were taking with Elohim. It is, however, unlikely that Jesus was a Nazarite because he did drink wine in multiple occasions and he was even accused of drinking too much wine. And also in the instance where he brings Lazarus forth back from the dead, well, probably as a Nazarite he wouldn't have got even close to that, even though we don't know how close he got. He simply used his voice, so that one is a little weak as an argument. We don't know, however, if as an adult Jesus decide at one period of time to take the vow for a specific amount of time. We don't know that. And the only reason why I'm bringing forth this possibility is because of this scripture. Mark 14, 25, truly I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Is this the beginning of a Nazarite vow? Well, if it was, then from that point onward, he would have stopped cutting his hair. We don't know that. And unfortunately, there isn't enough information for us to support any of the two ideas. It is less likely that he had a Nazarite vow, 
but we cannot exclude it 100%. One thing I would like to add as my personal opinion, so take it as such, is that if you think about it, even when you think about your own life, did you always have the exact same length of hair throughout the entirety of your life? Did you always have the exact same length of beard throughout the entirety of your life? I want to say that for the majority, if not 99% of us, the answer is going to be no. So it is possible that even though we tend to always imagine Jesus looking the exact same for the entirety of his adult life, it is possible that because he was an individual who clearly didn't particularly care about your outward appearance, but he was more concerned with your inside and the way you were inside it is possible that the length of his hair varied sometimes it got longer sometimes he would cut it and got shorter and possibly that's the same for his beard it is possible that one day he decided to just shave his beard how it is also possible that sometimes he would just let it grow longer to me it just makes more logical sense that probably sometimes he would have had longer hair and other times he didn't. I understand that, for example, Professor Joan Taylor brings forth the idea that she believes that most likely Jesus had short hair because people in that specific area had short hair at the time and that is probably the only point I disagree with because we know that Jesus, according to the teachings that we have, didn't really care much for imitating what other people did. And some of the things that he was saying at the time were considered to be controversial, hence the hatred of high priests against him. So considering the way he lived, I think that yes, even if the common Judean of the time would have had short hair, it is possible that Jesus, not caring, let his hair grow a little longer. Okay, noble one, and with this I'd like to close this very long adventure that we went through together trying to understand what historical Yeshua actually looked like. But of course, let me know what you think and your opinions in the comments below. Of course, as always, remember, I respect your opinions, even if they differ to mine, as long as they are shared in a civil way that will be absolutely fine and I'll be looking forward to reading your opinions. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please remember thumbs up, share this video, become a noble one, subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron. And remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.